Uh, sir, I had a query. Yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, could you please confirm the deadline of the assignment uh, two? Assignment two, right? So for yeah. assignment two, the deadline is uh, 13th. 13th is the next Monday. Uh, next. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. 13th, end of the day. That means 13th at 11.55. Thank you, sir. So, sir, what is the timing of test like 9 to 10 or 10 to 11? Uh, can you please repeat? So, what is the timing of test on 10? Uh, during the class hours. Okay. Okay, fine. So, then let us continue with. Uh, the topic that uh, we are discussing in the last class. So we are talking about this uh, Nakamoto consensus at the proof of work mechanism. So what we have seen that uh, it is a kind of complete decentralized uh, consensus algorithm in an open environment where multiple miners uh, participate and they try to mine a new block. And whenever they are mining a new block uh, to break the FLP impossibility, uh, what this Nakamoto consensus does that it gives more weightage to liveness compared to safety and as a result what happens that uh, uh, it, we, we consider or we have uh, divided the safety requirements into two parts. So first part of the safety requirement says that well whatever block you are going to add in the blockchain uh, that is a kind of correct and valid block and the second requirement says that well uh, the block that you are going to add in the blockchain that is going to be the final block, so which we call as the consensus finality. Uh, so uh, what Nakamoto consensus does that it makes a trade-off. Uh, it gives more priority to liveness compared to safety and as a consequence the second requirement of safety that means to ensure that the block you are going to add in the blockchain is the final block. This particular requirement is violated. So as a consequence what happens that um, it tries to generate a valid block. So every miner independently tries to generate a valid block and include that block in the blockchain without uh, having any kind of agreement among them that this is going to be the final block or this is going to be the unique block that is getting added to the blockchain. As a consequence, what happens that we might result in a fork and uh, whenever there is a result or whenever a fork is resulted, then Eventually, uh, this kind of blockchains, they consider the longest chain. That means uh, it applies the 50% rule saying that, well, whenever you are hearing multiple blocks from your neighbor, you accept the block which you are hearing from more of your neighbors. As a consequence, what happens that eventually one block gets propagated over the network out of the two blocks. And uh, that way, uh, one block becomes part of the longest chain and another block that gets abandoned. And this abundant block we call it as a kind of fork block and that way uh, the fork can happen and uh, it doesn't uh, ensure that the coin consensus finality is immediate rather it kinds of uh, tries to ensure kind of eventual finality of the consensus that means whenever you are adding a new block then um, so for example bitcoin it ensures that uh, a particular block is not uh, spendable or rather the transactions which have been added to that block is not spendable unless uh, six more blocks have been added to the blockchain. So as a consequence, you are just delaying the usage of the transactions that are there in the block, ensuring that this block is the final in your in your blockchain. That means it has become a part of the longest chain. So this was the kind of broad idea behind uh, proof of work. Now let us see that uh, what kind of uh, security attacks are possible on such kind of model and how this particular consensus mechanism actually prevent uh, from this attack. So one of the prominent attack for any kind of decentralized environment or any kind of distributed environment is the civil attack. So what is civil attack? Civil attack basically says that well, uh, the attacker attempts to fill the network with clients under its control. Well, so that basically means that what might happen in case of a Bitcoin network or a kind of typical blockchain network that you can create your multiple identities. So for example, if you have uh, learned about the Bitcoin network, in case of Bitcoin network, you can create multiple different wallets with multiple different public address. And that way, 
you can basically flood the network um, with, with public addresses which are under your control. Well, now these public addresses or these particular wallets or these nodes which are uh, under the control of the attacker, they deny to perform the valid activities of the blockchain. So, for example, they might refuse to relay the valid blocks or they might relay the kind of attack blocks or non-valid blocks. Now, for this kind of uh, particular attack, what is actually happening that uh, you are you are delaying the normal procedure of the operation or you are creating a kind of partitioning in the network. So, for example, if you ensure that, well, uh, if you look into the network architecture of the entire peer-to-peer -peer network and if you can just uh, make a control of the blocks which can create a partition of the network, then you can prevent uh, the message which is getting originated from one part of the network to get propagated to other part of the network, right? And as I was mentioning in the uh, last meeting or the last class that, uh, well, the entire security of uh, such kind of architecture is uh, based on the assumption that, well, uh, more than majority of the network are uh, doing the valid activities or more of the or majority of the participants in the network, they are not in the control of an attacker. Now, if an attacker can actually participate the network into two parts, then eventually you can see that the attacker is preventing the valid messages to get propagated from one part of the network to another part of the network. Well, now if it happens that well, the attacker takes uh, or, or make a partition where one partition contains more than 50% of the node, and the messages which are generated from those nodes, they are not getting propagated to other part of the network, then the entire security primitive of the uh, blockchain gets violated, right? So this can be a kind of serious attack in the context of blockchain. And again, to prevent the civil attack, uh, one of the primary requirements is that uh, you need to ensure that your network is sufficiently large so that even by gaining control over a large number of participants and uh, uh, attacker, an attacker will not be able to partition the network. Well, so, so that is the kind of prime requirement of any kind of distributed uh, environment that an attacker should not be able to partition the network in any any context. So that actually we try to prevent here uh, with the help of uh, the different kind of attack mitigation technique. Now, uh, the general solution to uh, prevent such kind of civil attack on a, on a blockchain kind of architecture is to diversify the connection. Now, how to diversify the connection? So different um, blockchain platform applies different kind of mechanism to diversify the connection. And the broad idea is that uh, you should not allow uh, uh, multiple different connections to get concentrated on the same network. Well, so here is one example that Bitcoin typically does. So what uh, happens that Bitcoin allows only one outbound connection to parse last 16 block of IP addresses. Well, so that means, uh, so for example, you cannot make both 202.141.81.2 16 and 202.141.80.18 16 as your peer. Well, so that means whenever you are connecting to your peers, you need to get the peers from diverse IP addresses, uh, ensuring that you are not getting connected or all of your peers not belong to the same network. Well, so typically, whenever the attacker will create multiple such uh, identities, it is likely that all those identities is uh, working on the same network. Well, it is difficult to create multiple identities globally on diverse network. Well, so that is the core idea here that you, you do not allow the peers or you do not allow to get connected to the peers which are, which are from the same network. So under a slash 16 block of IP addresses, you only choose one node as your peer. So that way you can diversify the connection and if you can diversify the connection, then uh, you can ensure that, well, you are not getting connected to more number of nodes, more number of attack nodes, or it, it is not like that more than 50% of your peers are the attack nodes. So remember that if more than 50% of the um, um, of your peers become the attack nodes, then actually you got influenced by the attacker because you will rely on the message which you are getting from majority of your peers. Right now, whenever you are relying on the message that you are getting from majority of your peers, and if majority of your peers belong to the attackers, then you are actually in the influence of attacker. Well, so that we want to prevent here. So, and that is the reason we want to diversify the connection to ensure that well, 
uh, majority of my peers doesn't belong to the same network. That means if a network is under the control of an attacker, then I do not have uh, a large number of peers from, from that attack network. Well, so, so that way, I will ensure that I, it, it will never happen that more than 50% of my peers are under the control of an attacker. So these are the kind of uh, way to prevent the civil attack uh, on, a, on a kind of typical proof of work based uh, blockchain architecture. Another kind of attack which can happen here is the kind of denial of service. Well, so uh, the denial of service attack works in this way that you send a lot of transactions to a block, uh, to a node, and that way you block the processing power of that node. So if you are sending a lot of transactions to a block, uh, to a node, then that node will only only process those transactions and most of its computing power is getting wasted for processing those set of transactions. Well, so to prevent such kind of denial of service attack, uh, this proof of work based blockchain, they provide different kind of limits on the uh, kind of uh, actions or the kind of messages that you can propagate. So for example, it limit the forwarding of blocks. That means um, how many number of blocks you can forward, then it disconnect a peer that sends too many transactions. Well, um, so, so that way, such kind of preventive measures are being taken to avoid the denial of service uh, kind of attacks. Now, as I was mentioning earlier, that this Bitcoin proof of work is computationally difficult to break. Well, so theoretically, it is difficult to break, but it is not impossible. Well, so anyone can break the proof of work algorithm if you can gain more than 50% of the mining power. Well, uh, so what typically the attacker does, the attackers deploy high power servers to do more work than the total work of the blockchain. So that way, the attacker tries to gain access of more than 50% of the hash power or more than 50% of the mining power, what you call. Uh, so if you can gain access to more than 50% of the hash power or more than 50% of the mining power of a, of a blockchain network, then actually you can you can do whatever you want. Well, so so uh, in, 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 in that case, you can raise the uh, uh, different kind of attacks, including double spending. And interestingly, this double spending uh, uh, was was uh, not uh, kind of rare on, on Bitcoin network. So there are multiple instances when uh, such kind of double spending has happened and many of the times this kind of double spending so as from the mining pools so mining pools means more than one miners they create a kind of agreement among themselves and they collectively try to mine a block so that is the kind of idea of mining pools and uh, so for example in november 2013 uh, so this ghash.io mining pool uh, it, it uh, actually introduced uh, repeated payment uh, uh, against this Bitcoin dice, which was a kind of gambling website. So what it what it did, so it, it used the same Bitcoin uh, to make a payment to this uh, gambling website. Well, and uh, that was the kind of double spending, and uh, that double spending was possible because it was able to gain uh, more than 50% of the mining power of the blockchain. Uh, and that way, there are other instances of uh, such kind of double spending on the proof of work blockchain. If you just do a simple Google search, you can find it out that there are multiple such instances which are there. Uh, another important and interesting problem of uh, this uh, proof of work blockchain is this monopoly problem. Well, uh, so this also I was mentioning earlier that the proof of work depends on the computing resources which is available to a miner. Well, so that way, the miners which are having more amount of resources, they have more probability to complete the work. Well, because so for example, if I just try to find out that nonce in my laptop, uh, so possibly I will I will do a kind of, so as, as you already know that finding out that nonce requires kind of um, uh, repeated uh, trial and error kind of method. Uh, and that way, if I just keep on trying on my machine, the way I will do the computation, it is much more slower if I do the computation on a server. Well, so that way, the miner who has uh, more amount of uh, mining power, uh, they actually gain certain advantage. So they will be able to find out the uh, uh, find out the uh, nonce uh, much more faster compared to you, and that is the one of the reason you will see 
uh, if you just look into the current uh, blocks which are getting generated or which are getting mined in the Bitcoin blockchain, you will see that 99%, even more than 99% of those blocks are generated by some uh, mining pools. Well, so it is, I think, uh, practically impossible to independently generate a block uh, because the way these mining pools are actually decentralizing the mining power among multiple different miners and that way uh, they are they are being able to generate the blocks in in, in much more faster way well, uh, and this monopoly problem actually in in blockchain that can uh, increase over time uh, and and this is actually one of the classical problem from the theory of probability which is uh, called the tragedy of commons uh, this is an interesting uh, problem uh, in the game theory literature, which actually shows that uh, in a probabilistic way, um, uh, what actually happens that over the time, uh, uh, certain certain person in a community, they gain more power over others. Well, and the broad idea is something like this, that the miners, they will get less reward over time. So what happens that more and more miners are joined and at the same time the complexity gets increased and the amount of reward that is given to the miners that got reduced. Well, so that way the miners will get less reward over time. Uh, as the miners will get less reward over time, that way the users will get discouraged to join as the miner. So when that will happen, that means the few miners will the large computing resources, they can get control over the network. So uh, that way, one of the interesting attack scenario which can happen on proof of work blockchain is this 51% attack. So the 51% attack says that a group of miners, they control more than 50% of the hash rate of the network. Well, now for Bitcoin, it is somehow hypothetical as of now because the size of the Bitcoin network is very large. So that's why getting or gaining uh, more than 50% of the mining power or more than 50% of the hash rate is not yet been possible for any miners or mining pool. Uh, but it was not impossible. So it, it happened for uh, Ethereum network, say one of the Ethereum uh, test network, which was called Krypton uh, in August 2016. Well, so the miners were able to gain, uh, certain miners were able to gain more than 50% of the has power and they, they actually controlled uh, uh, majority of the block generation in that particular blockchain. And uh, very recently there is uh, another attack on, uh, uh, so in the, in the last month there was another attack on uh, uh, Bitcoin Lite, which actually uh, showed that such kind of 51% attacks are possible when your network is not that much, much large. Well, so, so that way, um, uh, one of the primary requirement of uh, securing the kind of proof of work blockchain architecture is to ensure that you are sufficiently diversified and that your network is sufficiently large. Well, so that uh, you can, uh, so that none of the attacker can get a control of more than 50% of the uh, hash power of the of the of the blockchain. So this is one of the kind of very primary requirement uh, for maintaining the security or safety of the proof of work blockchain. So any query up to this point? Okay. So let me proceed to it, uh, the kind of limitations that the proof of work has. So the good thing in the proof of work is that it is a fully decentralized consensus protocol for permissionless models. So for cryptocurrencies, it works good. Uh, at least it serves the purpose of a cryptocurrency. It has been able to make the cryptocurrencies truly decentralized, truly, uh, truly out of control from any kind of intermediaries or any kind of bank or government. And it was uh, uh, helping to uh, have the cryptocurrency trading uh, for cross-border uh, uh, remittances and cross-border trading. Uh, so such kind of such kind of thing was possible with uh, proof of work. But uh, the problem of this proof of work alg algorithm is that uh, it you do not trust in individual, but you trust the society as a whole. Well, 
so although we are saying that we are doing a kind of trustless computing with the help of this uh, proof of work blockchain but the uh, inherent assumption is that you are not trusting the individual rather you are trusting the society as a whole and you are assuming that your network is large enough so that this 51% attack is not possible okay uh, now the problem is that such kind of requirement that uh, you have a sufficiently large network where 50% 51% attack is impossible uh, this particular assumption is not suitable for enterprise applications because enterprise applications typically work within a close boundary well so it, it doesn't it doesn't like that it is a kind of complete open application anyone can join in the network anyone can participate in the transaction so it is not like that well so the cryptocurrencies you can say that it is a kind of very open network but the enterprise application so by enterprise applications i mean the applications like the supply chain management the kind of identity management like the kyc management this kind of this kind of applications and here you can see that you do not have that theoretically infinite number of participants in the network well so your network is always closed and there are kind of handful number of participants in your network if that is the case then it is difficult to prevent the 51% attack on such kind of architecture and that is one of the major limitation of proof of work but the real limitation of this proof of work blockchain is that uh, it has very low transaction throughput well so for example in case of bitcoin you can have 3.3 to 7 transactions per second in case of ethereum it can support around 15 transactions per second so this throughput the effective throughput that you have uh, it is very low and the primary requirement is the overhead which is coming while finding out the nonce uh, by, by computing the hash function randomly. Well, so you need to keep on trying to find out the hash function until you are successful and depending on the current difficulty level of uh, this kind of proof of work uh, blockchain, uh, you need a good amount of time to, time to uh, invest to find out that nonce value for the hash function. Well, and as a consequence, uh, the block generation gets delayed. Um, and another important uh, limitation of this uh, proof of work is the overuse of the computing power. Well, so you have millions of miners uh, who are actually participated and maybe thousands of them at a time, they try to mine a new block, but only one gets success. Well, even if more than one gets success, but ultimately the reward is given to only one um, uh, miner whose block has been added or whose block has been uh, the part of the main chain. So that means ultimately you are, you are utilizing the hash power, power from one miner who had been successfully uh, been able to connect uh, a new block to the existing blockchain. But uh, the power that has been invested by the other miners, that got wasted. Well, and this is basically a kind of a major limitation for uh, such kind of proof of work blockchain. And if you look, that the energy consumption that happens over Bitcoin, well, that is actually significantly higher. So if I just, uh, this is a simple graph, if I try to uh, quantify it, so remember that this y-axis shows the values in terms of terawatt hour per year. Um, so if I, if I just try to quantify that how much, uh, 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 how much uh, energy is getting consumed whenever you are mining the Bitcoin. So if you look into the carbon footprint, so this carbon footprint for Bitcoin is uh, for every transaction in a Bitcoin is equivalent to 137,578 hours of watching YouTube. Well, so from this simple statistics, you can, you can identify that how costly a transaction is uh, in terms of the carbon footprint that is being generated. Well, uh, then, uh, if you look into the electrical energy consumption per transactions, so this electrical energy consumption per transactions is equivalent to the power consumption of an average US household over 59.56 days. Okay. So, so that way you can understand that even for having one transactions in a Bitcoin network, you are requiring a huge amount of power that is resulting in a significant amount of carbon footprint. And that way, this is one of the major limitations or major drawback of the proof of work blockchain. Well, and globally, people have actually trying to 
find out algorithms, trying to find out mechanisms which can actually reduce such kind of um, energy consumption and such kind of carbon footprint. But again, the issue of doing or having uh, an algorithm uh, which supports the property of Bitcoin or which supports the requirement of Bitcoin uh, is not easy to find out. Well, because you want to go to uh, in a complete decentralized architecture while maintaining uh, certain part of safety and certain and, and, and the liveness of the protocol. Well, so this is this is kind of challenging in case of a uh, real environment. Now, as a consequence, several other uh, mechanism for reaching consensus in a open blockchain environment that have been designed. So one of the idea was this proof of stake or POS. Uh, so possibly this POS was proposed in 2011 uh, by a member in the Bitcoin forum. So there is no formal paper or formal document that explains this proof of stake. Rather, uh, that idea came from uh, uh, a member of the Bitcoin forum that posted in the Bitcoin forum and then uh, uh, people uh, accepted that idea and some of the uh, blockchain network, they have tried to use that idea. So the idea of this uh, proof of stake was that uh, this probability of mining a block, it depends on the work done by the miner in case of proof of work, right? But in case of proof of stake, uh, the stake that the miner holds, that means the amount of Bitcoin that the miner holds, depending on that, the miner will be able to mine the new block. Okay? So for example, the miner holding 1% of the Bitcoin can mine 1% of the POS. Uh, so the core idea is something like that, that you start with the proof of work. Now, as you are progressing with the proof of work, certain miners, they are getting Bitcoins out of this, uh, out of participating in uh, proof of work mining procedure. And the miner who are getting more amount of uh, um, uh, stake or more amount of Bitcoin, uh, in proportion to that, they will be able to generate the blocks. Well. So you can you can gradually shift from a proof of work mechanism to a proof of stake mechanism. So you bootstrap with proof of work. Then, as you see, that new miners are not getting interested in participating in the uh, mechanism. Then, just to uh, encourage the miners to still getting participated, what you can do, you can say that well, if you are holding one percent of the Bitcoin, then you can you can mine one percent of the POS blocks. Okay. And the transaction fees which are which are there in those blocks that will be given to the miners who is generating the block. Uh, so this proof of stake it provides increased increased protection uh, because uh, executing an attack is expensive on proof of stake. Uh, to generate an attack, you need more bitcoins because uh, these bitcoins are your stake which you are uh, keeping for um, for uh, mining a new block. Well, uh, and and that way you have reduced incentive for attack. So uh, to raise an attack, an attacker actually need to own a majority of the Bitcoin. Well, uh, so that way the effect will uh, the attack will have more effect on the attacker itself well, uh, because the attacker has to need attacker need to gain more uh, or attacker need to own the majority of the Bitcoin. So the attacker need to spend a lot of Bitcoin, a lot of money to raise an attack. Uh, so, so that way, uh, it actually discourages the attacker to participate in the, or to launch an attack on the blockchain. Well, uh, now in the literature, there are different variations of stake that have been uh, utilized. Uh, say there was idea of randomization in combination of the stake that is used in Next and Blackcoin. Uh, there is another uh, idea of coinage, uh, which was actually much more popular and that have been utilized in different uh, proof of stake blockchain. So, so the coinage basically says that the number of coins multiplied by the number of days the coins have been held. Well, so that is used in the uh, PR coin architecture. So it basically says that, well, to participate in the mining procedure, you, you not only have to uh, hold some amount of Bitcoin, but you need to keep the Bitcoin for some duration. Well, that actually further discourages the attacker to participate in the attacker attack. So it might happen that the attacker can just momentarily buy a large amount of Bitcoin and participate in the attack. So this 
coinage, the idea of coinage is actually preventing those attackers. It basically says that, well, to launch an attack, it is not only that you need to gain a lot of Bitcoin, but you need to keep that Bitcoin for a longer duration. Okay. Uh, so, so that way, different variant of stake that uh, got introduced in the market, and uh, then other variants of uh, this proof of work or open consensus mechanism that uh, uh, that was introduced. Uh, another idea of that proof of burn. So, in case of proof of burn, the miner should show proof that they have burned some coins. Well, uh, so burning some coins means you have sent them to a verifiably unspendable address. So, you are sending the coin to an address uh, that way the coin get debited from your account. Uh, but but uh, at the same time, uh, it doesn't uh, got credited to any account because you are sending to an account where uh, the account is unspendable. So it, it will not be able to spend those bitcoins. Well, so this particular idea is expensive just like proof of work because you are ultimately burning the proof of work bitcoins, proof of work mine bitcoins. But the advantage is that you do not need any kind of external resources other than the burn coins. Well, so that means you are burning some kind of virtual currency or the virtual uh, resource that had done burning some physical resource. So in case of proof of work, it was burning of physical resource like the power consumption, the power of your device. But here you are burning some kind of virtual uh, virtual resource. So you 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 got some Bitcoin by utilizing this uh, proof of work, and that particular proof of work mined uh, Bitcoin you are burning here. Okay. So that was uh, another idea. Now this proof of stake or proof of burn, burn all these methods, ultimately they depend on proof of work mine cryptocurrencies. Okay, so you cannot use them to bootstrap a new blockchain. So if you want to use uh, proof of stake or proof of burn, you need to start with proof of work. Well, once you get certain amount of coin, then either you need to show that you have a good amount of stake with you, either in terms of coinage or other metrics that are being used in case of proof of stake. Or what you have to do that you have to burn certain amount of proof of work mined Bitcoin. Well, that means you need to send them to some unspendable address where, where that, that particular uh, coins cannot be spent. So that way you are you are uh, what you are doing that you are ultimately depending on the proof of work. So that means you need to start with proof of work and as proof of work gets saturated. So that means the miners will not get much incentives from participating in the proof of work and their are still going to uh, utilize their computing power to mine the block. During that instances, you can stop proof of work and you can migrate to either proof of stake or proof of work. Uh, so, so again, means as I was saying, like this proof of stake, proof of burn, they cannot work like a independent consensus algorithm from the scratch. Well, you need to start with proof of work and then you need to move to this kind of algorithms to save the energy over the system. Okay. Any kind of any question or any query up to this point? Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, in the previous previous slide, uh, we said that if a uh, miner holds a particular percentage of the uh, bitcoins, then uh, he will be allowed to mine only that percentage in the proof of stake. Sir. What do we yeah. mean by that percentage of proof, proof of stake? Is there a pre-decided uh, amount of uh, the bitcoins which can be generated? Uh, it is not a uh, predefined one, but the way the protocol runs, eventually it ensures that. Thing. And so it is it is something like that. Uh, ultimately, see, ultimately you are doing a kind of randomization. So, for example, assume that I have uh, 10 Bitcoin and you have 90 Bitcoin. Now, if I have 10 Bitcoin and you have 90 Bitcoin now, with probability uh, 1 by 10, I will be selected to mine a new block. And with probability 9 by 10, you will be selected to mine a new block. Well, so that means eventually what will happen if we are going to together mine 100 different blocks, then I will possibly mine around 10 number of blocks and you will mine around nine, uh, 90 number of blocks. Well, so that way, eventually, it is being satisfied that well, if I am having uh, X percentage of Bitcoin with me, then um, I will I will uh, uh, 
um, uh, mine x percentage of new blocks to the blockchain. Well, so it is a kind of eventual guarantee. So it is not like that the percentages are set up right because the amount of Bitcoin that individual has that also changes with time. Well, sir, but uh, like eventual guarantee will be resulted only if we take a decision at that particular instance. So uh, why, while at, at a particular snapshot of the situation, we have to decide how many uh, uh, bitcoins a particular person will be allowed to uh, uh, mine. So how do we take that decision? Yeah, that is uh, it is it is something like that. See, assume that. So for example, if a public address claims that I have hundred bitcoin, well, from the blockchain you can actually verify that, right? Because uh, this 100 bitcoins, so these 100 bitcoins are actually not the converted bitcoins. They are basically the mined bitcoins. What are these mined bitcoins? So if you remember that whenever uh, uh, a new block is generated in case of bitcoin, the first transaction of every block, which we are called as the genesis transaction, so that particular transaction contains a reward to the miner. So that reward amount is actually the new Bitcoin which are being generated from the mining procedure. Now, if I so so that particular transactions are available in the in the blockchain, right? For every block. So that means if you look into the history of the blockchain, anyone can find out that which miner holds what percentage percentage of POW generated bitcoins, right? Now, if you can find it out and if I generate a kind of distributed algorithm, the algorithm says that in every 10 different turns, well, so, so there are assumed two miners. One miner got one Bitcoin out of this proof of work block mining. Another miner got, uh, 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 say, uh, 10 or another miner got uh, nine Bitcoin. Okay, out of those proof of work mining, then anyone in the blockchain network can verify that well, miner one has one Bitcoin and miner nine has nine Bitcoin. So the scheduling can work like this that well, the first block will be generated by miner one and the remaining nine block will be generated by miner two. Well, and then again, the 11 block will be generated by miner one. That way, you can do a kind of distributed scheduling. Understood, okay. sir. Thank you, sir. And what exact scheduling algorithm you are going to use that actually vary from different blockchains. Say PR coin uses one, one algorithm, uh, next black coin, they use another algorithm. But eventually they, they actually try to guarantee this based on the information which is already available in the blockchain. Okay. Any other query? Sir, I have a, a little bit basic question. So uh, when you say that uh, in uh, in Bitcoin only one connection from a 16 uh, slash 16 block will be uh, accepted by certain node. So uh, when when a new node comes into the network, how does it get the uh, IP addresses of the nodes that are uh, running the Bitcoin? Good question. So uh, if you remember in uh, one of the classes taken by Professor Shural, he mentioned about these applets, right? So the client applets. So typically the default Bitcoin, it provides you a client applet and at the same time, uh, there are other custom designed applets which are also available in the web. So what all those applet does, those applet actually contains a set of uh, IP addresses which are already part of the network. Well, now the joining is like this. The joining is uh, from those set of uh, IP addresses which are there. You keep on trying and you find out whether that IP address is currently live. If that IP address is live, you can create a connection to that IP address uh, to set it as a PR. You can actually see it whenever you are doing that um, uh, or, or running that uh, Ethereum client, Ethereum client application or that gist uh, application, right? So whenever you are running it, initially you will see that it is running a PR discovery algorithm. And what that PR discovery algorithm is, that PR discovery algorithm actually, uh, it already has a predefined set of IP addresses. Uh, your machine will try to get connected to those IP addresses. And whenever 
say I am uh, say, say say I am I am running that applications and you are also running that applications. So I get connected to you. Okay, somehow I got that IP address which was uh, hard coded in my app and uh, I get connected to you. Then again, you are connected to some other IP addresses. Those IP addresses. If those are not in my list already, they will be propagated to me and my application will save that in my list. Well, so next time whenever I will switch on, I will also can try to directly connect those IP addresses. Okay, so some no, initial IP addresses this, are hard coded. This, this hard coding yeah. of IP addresses should be like a security risk, right? So like if the if these, these nodes are compromised and the yeah. nodes That's that are connected to it, they are also compromised, then you are de by definition to compromise network. Yeah, absolutely, you are right. And yeah, that is the reason if you look into the general guidelines of using Bitcoin, Bitcoin always says that you always use an applet uh, which is reliable. Either you use the default, app, default applet from uh, Bitcoin, well, so this default applet from the Bitcoin.org, it, it actually has a set of verifiable IP addresses. Those IP addresses, uh, it already knows that uh, these are not the attacker nodes, these are the kind of general nodes. Or you use a third party app which you can trust or which you can know that well, multiple other people are using that and that is a genuine applet. Okay, actually, that happened in the market. That happened in the market in the sense the attackers uh, have uh, released uh, applets with those attack nodes, and that is that is a very common kind of attack uh, uh, which happens in kind of Bitcoin network. If you mistakenly choose an applet where, uh, which was designed by an attacker and it contains the IP addresses of the attack nodes, then you are actually get connected to those attack nodes. Well, so again, means uh, the thing that I was repeating earlier that um, it is not like that. So, so, so we always keep on hearing that uh, Bitcoin or blockchain is a kind of revolutionary technology. It can, it can make everything perfectly secure. It doesn't make everything perfectly secure. The user also have certain responsibility. The society as a whole also have certain responsibility to make the architecture secure. Well, the good thing that it provides is that it provides transparency. Well, you can see that what is happening in the network. But at the same time, um, uh, if you are if you are not utilizing a verifiable uh, pre-verified applet or if you are if you are not verifying your peers or if you are not say, say just for um, ensuring that you are not uh, utilizing a lot of computing resources from your machine uh, you have you have uh, just connected to a blockchain network and you are not verifying the transactions okay if you are not verifying the transactions you can fall prey to such kind of attack same thing happens for the applet as well. Means if you are not verifying the applet uh, application properly, and if you are taking an applet application uh, from the um, uh, from an attacker node, you can get connected to an attacker. Node. Okay. Any other query? So in that percentage one. Uh... Uh, like who decides uh, uh, about who is going to mine the next block? Yeah, mm -hmm. that I was saying that it is a kind of decentralized algorithm which is getting executed. Now, what PR coin typically does, it uses uh, a random function on that coinage. Well, so later on, just hold for a few days. Uh, after I cover the consensus algorithms for the permission model, I will discuss about one very interesting idea that is called Algorand. Well, so Algorand actually somehow combines ideas from proof of work, proof of stake, that um, uh, standard distributed consensus algorithms, and it is it is a very interesting, very, very interesting idea. So in case of Algorand, actually you will see that there are cryptographic function, well, uh, something called a verifiable random function or VRF. You can utilize those kind of cryptographic function to uniquely determine the output based on a randomized algorithm. So I'll come to that uh, in details whenever we are discussing about um, uh, this algorithm. So it is that that scheduling algorithm again, as you can understand that that need to be done in a kind of 
distributed way. But how how it is actually being done? That the idea is something like this. So uh, you can you can just think of one very simple algorithm, right? So the simple algorithm can be something like this: that uh, uh, I know that so I am I am trying to participate as a miner. Well, so I know that I have one bitcoin. And by looking into the blockchain, current blockchain, and can find out that till now, say thousand different uh, bitcoins or thousand uh, bitcoins have been mined. Well, now if I can find out that thousand bitcoins have been mined till now, and I have one bitcoin, so with one by thousand probability, I start participating in the mining procedure. Well. Uh, so that is that can be a very simple idea, but but again you can understand that if I start applying this idea, then um, uh, the probability of fork gets increased significantly. And actually, in the standard proof of stake uh, algorithm, this probability of fork is very high. Uh, in that algorithm, algorand mechanism that I was just mentioning, they actually also tries to reduce this probability of fork. Any other query? Also, let me know. I Means, if you are not satisfied with the answer that are given by me, if you want to have some further discussion, yeah, let me know. Not a problem. Okay. Uh, so let me proceed uh, further. So there are other uh, mechanism that have been designed uh, for uh, uh, this uh, open blockchain network. Uh, this proof of elapsed time is another of them, uh, POET. Uh, so this proof of elapsed time that was proposed by Intel as a part of this hyperledger sawtooth uh, that was uh, one uh, uh, branch of hyperledger blockchain. Uh, this uh, this is a blockchain platform for building distributed ledger applications. So this uh, this was developed by Intel and it used an idea called proof of elapsed time or POET. So the basic idea is that each participant in the blockchain network waits a random amount of time. Now the first participant to finish. Uh, will, you, will you go to the presentation? It is not showing. Now. It, is showing. it is not showing. Or is it there? Okay, maybe uh, in my system then. Okay. Others can see. If others are able to see, it is fine. Okay. Just let me know if you are not being able to see. Okay. Yeah, it might be more some issue on my. Side. Yeah, you can help. Okay, so I'm in the slide of proof of elapsed time. Just oh, it is there. Right, right. I made a mistake. Yeah. Okay, good. Fine. Uh, so, yeah. So, the idea of this POET is that uh, you wait for a random amount of time. Well, now, uh, so it is, so say, assume that I'm, I'm taking a clock duration of 20 minutes and I generate a random number in between 0 to 20. Well, now, whenever I'm generating a random number in between 0 to 20, that means uh, say I can generate uh, 11, Professor, Sh Professor Shural can generate uh, uh, say uh, 10, uh, say Abhinav can generate uh, 8, and that way each of us will generate different number. Now the participant who will generate the least number, that participant or that miner or whatever you call it, they will wait for that many number of time and generate the new thing. Now, the question comes that uh, how do you ensure that I am not cheating here? Well, so it might happen that I have used my machine to execute a random function that will generate a random number in between 0 to 20. Actually, it generates a random number called 18. And uh, I, I claim that, well, it has not generated 18, but it has generated 8. Okay, and as an attacker, I can always do so. And the idea core idea here is that if we use this kind of randomization, then it is likely that um, in every different round, different participant will get elected to mine the next block or to generate the next block. Well, so it is it is somehow a kind of leader election algorithm. That means that every round I am electing a leader and that leader is proposing the new block or that leader is generating the new block. And how I am electing the leader? I am electing the leader based on this random function. Well, I'm saying that, well, Everyone generates a random number. Who is going to generate a random number uh, uh, having the smallest value? That person becomes the leader, and that person is able to generate the next one. Well, 
Now here comes the challenge, like, that, like how you are going to prove this, that you have generated the smallest number. Right? Uh, so for doing that verification, that uh, you have generated the lowest number and you have actually waited for that many uh, minutes or that many time units uh, before you have proposed a new block. Uh, this hyperledger short or uh, this proof of elapsed time um, algorithm, it uses a hardware construction. So it utilizes a special CPU instruction set that is called a Intel software guard extension or Intel HCX, uh, which is a trusted execution platform. Uh, so the idea of this trusted execution platform is that it is a part of the hardware. Whatever computations you are doing there, that cannot be uh, tampered by any operating system or any application. Okay, so it is basically a trusted code which is private to the rest of the application. So the specialized hardware at the SGX it provides an attestation that the trusted code has been set up correctly and it has been executed correctly. Okay, so you can actually use this concept of uh, SGH to actually take the help of the hardware uh, to have an attestation that well, your clock has got executed that many uh, time units and then only you have generated the new clock. Well, but as you can understand that well, one good thing of proof of elapsed time is that it can be used to bootstrap a new blockchain. Uh, but the problem of proof of elastic time is that it is only uh, or it is it is dependent on this Intel SGX and that's why it has a kind of significant hardware dependency uh, for, for getting it executed. You cannot execute it on any of the machine. So that way different kind of uh, algorithms that got proposed uh, over time. There are many other uh, uh, techniques or many other open consensus algorithms that people proposed, but at the end of the day, it turned out that, well, uh, those are not that much robust or those algorithm has different kind of security concerns. And at the same time, um, this bootstrapping is always a challenge that, uh, so the major, major advantage of proof of work was that it was being able to bootstrap a new network. Also, you can, you can start proof of work from the beginning. So you can, you can, uh, start with a few trusted nodes and gradually you can increase the network. So that was the ability which has been given by proof of work. But uh, majority of the other consensus algorithms that actually rely on the proof of work and it basically says that whenever you are done with proof of work, you have reached to a kind of sufficient level in your blockchain uh, with the help of proof of work, then gradually you migrate to proof of stake or proof of burn kind of uh, consensus algorithm. And other consensus algorithms like proof of elapsed time, these are kind of very specialized algorithm uh, which needs specific hardware support or kind of specific device support where only you can run the blockchain. Okay. Uh, so these are the kind of set of uh, open consensus algorithms that we have discussed uh, uh, till today. Uh, so from tomorrow's class, we'll, we'll start discussing with uh, these consensus algorithms for the enterprise blockchain and uh, uh, how we can actually scale up the consensus algorithms and gradually in this direction of consensus, we look into uh, very few interesting research works that have been done in the last decade uh, to, to have uh, very interesting ideas of blockchain consensus. Well, uh, so I would like to stop with this particular cartoon. Um, so as you can see, uh, why I have put up this cartoon here means I am I'm not revealing it right now, but later on I am going to reveal. So the idea which is actually getting propagated by this cartoon, um, that was practically in the case of blockchain consensus. So uh, as we make progress uh, over, over our discussion on blockchain consensus or in general distributed consensus, you will see that there are some kind of interesting philosophy and all those philosophies actually revolved around that FLP impossibility. And people tried to tweak that FLP impossibility in different ways. Well, so one of the simplest tweaking that, or one of the kind of straightforward tweaking that was done by Nakamoto was uh, giving more priority to liveness. But uh, even after that, people tried to tweak uh, the different components of that FLP impossibility. So 
uh, one person have tried to visualize it in one way, another person have tried to visualize it in different way. And somehow you will find out that in a real network, uh, both of them are partially correct and none of them are actually completely correct. Well, so we'll see such kind of interesting developments, interesting research works. And um, uh, this blockchain consensus is still an open problem. If you look into uh, the recent literature, uh, the top conferences, you will find out that people are still publishing work on uh, efficient consensus algorithm. And uh, again, means majority of those works are just by tweaking the FLP impossibility in some or other way. So we'll, we'll see that in details. Okay, so I would like to stop here for today. Uh, any query or uh, any question from today's class or anything else? Okay, so if not, then uh, let us uh, stop here today, and uh, then we'll be we'll be meeting in the next class. Okay, thank you, everyone. Take care.